Now, last week we were in this series in Philippians, and we got to the kind of the end of chapter three, and we were kind of doing this good message. And my message last week was kind of basically press on, right? And no matter what you're facing, press on. In your pursuit of Christ, press on. We've pulled that from Philippians chapter three, verses twelve through twenty-one, where Paul tells us, and this is just a recap from last week, that we are not there yet. This is not the garden anymore. This is not heaven. Things are going to get broken. Things are not going to work like they're supposed to. Relationships are going to fail. Our bodies are going to fail. Our own selves are going to fail ourselves in our pursuit of Christ and our pursuit of righteousness. And yet, even though those things are true, we keep moving forward. We keep attempting to follow Christ because there is better, the place that we're going to, the Beulah land, if you want to call it that. That's where we're going. And God's going to make sure that we get there Some of us are going to get there earlier than others. Some of us are going to get there a little more prepared than others. But because of the work of Christ in us, we're going to get there to be with him. So we press on. But I didn't get a lot of time last week because I spent most of my time talking about exhortation. And I kind of exhorted you. In fact, that happens a lot of times in in Baptist sermons. We tell you, go out there and do something. Go out and do this. Or you're not supposed to be doing that. So stop doing that. Start doing this. But as you know, as well as I do, that exhortation education leads to frustration. I've told you this before. <clears throat> I am an esteemed uh, soccer coach when it comes to recplex leagues. And so with those little kids, I have an, uh, an impeccable record. I've served an assistant coach for many years and lost several games as an assistant coach. But as a head coach of our soccer team, I've never lost a game. It's kind of amazing in soccer games to do that. I never lost a game. And so we were so good at what we did, we'd usually play two or three levels up, and then I would kind of take a look at the team, and then I would let the head coach take over, and then when I'd look and see that we could beat that team, I'd become the head coach, let him sit down, take a rest. And so my record's perfect in that, and so we got to be so good, and we decided we'd go to Springfield, I've told you this before, and we thought we'd play indoor soccer. And we were so good at outdoor soccer, we thought, well, this has got to be the same thing as, as outdoor soccer, just inside, so we can go up there. So we went to this league, and we started looking around. We did some research that there were scores like 25 to 8. And if you know anything about soccer, that's like 750 to 394 in football. And so we're thinking, how in the world could that ever happen? <clears throat> and so we get into our first game, never seen the game, never played the game. We were competing against this team. They didn't know who we were, so they put us in the top league against the top team. And at halftime, we go into halftime and find ourselves down 20 to nothing at halftime. And so we gather the team around our, them, ourselves, and we said, boys, Here's our plan for the second half. One of the greatest speeches ever to go down in all sports, the way we gave them. We gathered them around, and we looked at them, and we looked at them in the faces, and they were tired faces and beat-up faces. We looked at their faces and said, boys, go out there and do better. <laughs> that was the speech, because we had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea what to tell the kids to do. We just said, go out there and do better, boys. And so oftentimes our preaching is like that, isn't it? Hey, y'all, church, go out there and do better. It's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Do better? What does that mean? How am I supposed to do better? There's also a problem, though, that exhortation without application leads to exhaustion. I was going to put the real word there. Exhortation without application leads to constipation, but I was afraid that you would not be happy about that one, so I didn't put that on the screen. But what that means is we can have all this knowledge, we can store up this knowledge, but if we don't apply the knowledge and nothing comes out of us, we become exhausted from that. You can go to the Holy Land today and the Sea of Galilee is a beautiful sea. Water comes in, water goes out. But you go to the Dead Sea, water goes in, but nothing comes out. It's dead. You could learn all you want to about snow skiing You can take courses online for snow skiing. You can buy some snow skis, but you can have those in Branson and be really frustrated and exhausted because you will get no snow, apparently. At least it's early February. We still have March, right? And March is usually our big snow month anyway when it comes. Good news is if it snows in March, the next day it'll be fine. It'll be like 90, and so it won't be any problem. But if you don't apply what you know, there's going to be exhaustion to that. Because we're not designed or called to learn a bunch of stuff and not do a bunch of stuff. you got to learn it to know what to do. But if you don't apply it, then you're going to become exhausted because you have all this knowledge. You have all this knowledge about how to get to heaven. And if you don't share that with other people, it'll exhaust you and frustrate you. So today what we want to do 
<coughs> is I want to give you the exhortation, I want to get you the education and the application so that you may have peace in the process of pressing on. In fact, today's passage in, in Philippians chapter 4 is so critical, so important, that I'm just going to kind of show you a few things about it, but it can revolutionize your life if you will let it, because we're looking for, in this world, peace. <coughs> peace not only to press on, but in the passage that we're going to look at today, the peace to stand firm. And those at first may seem opposite from one another, but, but sometimes you press on by standing firm, don't you? And sometimes you stand firm by pressing on. So here's what Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 tells us. Now, Paul tells us this, writing to a church that we've talked about before, a group of people who are following Christ at great cost, <coughs> at great sacrifice for what's going on in their life. And he tells them some things, but he, the things he tells them are motivated by love. Not motivated by anger, not motivated by frustration, but he's motivated by love. He's trying to tell them something because he loves them. Because if they do this, the ones that he loves will prosper. They will have peace in the difficulty and the times that they face and the times that we face. And so for us, I want you to know that, that sometimes my preaching may be a little, yeah, at you. But it's not because I'm mad at you or frustrated. It's because I, too, love you and I want you to do the best. And so many times I see in the church and in my own life, that though we may know what to do, we don't apply what we know, and then we become frustrated and exhausted, and we don't know why, and maybe the solution to the why is much closer than we think if we'll see what the passage says. So here's what Paul says to that church in Philippi. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown, I want you to stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So he's telling them that in the difficulties that they face, physical, financial, emotional, that he's calling them to continue to pursue Christ, to continue to pursue righteousness, to continue to be faithful and true no matter what comes. And he's telling them that that may mean for them to stand firm when the waves come against them, waves on the outside from the adversary, waves on the inside with their own emotions, but to stand firm Continue to pursue Christ and be obedient. And then he tells them how to do this. He says, first, you're going to need a unity of believers. Notice, he says, I entreat Yodia and the entreat Synetiki, however you pronounce that. You can pronounce it any way you want to. I'll probably choose two or three different options during the same sermon this morning. Because those are not little names that we have. And by the way, isn't it bad that the Bible has your name written in it and it's written in there because you did something wrong? I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Did you ever get your name on the board? And they still do that. Do they still have boards? I don't even know that you put your name on the board if you get in trouble. In fact, some of you kind of enjoyed that, and you liked having your name in lights, and that was as close as you were going to get. But here we have in the Bible <coughs> that Paul is calling out two individuals, two lady folks, with the name Yodia and the name Syntyche, I think is the closest I'm going to come today, and apparently they have a disagreement amongst themselves, and that disagreement is causing disunity within the body, so much so that when Paul writes a letter, he calls them out. That may be why we don't have very many women in our church with either one of those names because of that. But there's something about the church being unified which is so critical and so helpful and so beneficial, and sometimes you and I forget that not every church is like we are. Because though we may not all be the same, we get along with one another, right? In fact, about the only thing that we're going to fight about in this church is that we're not going to fight. That's the only thing we'll fight about. Because we're together in this. The gospel is more important than my preferences. The gospel is more important than my likes. The gospel is more important than what I think. The gospel and its need to move forward in the community is so much larger than any kind of petty com uh, confusion and petty uh, competitions and petty uh, disagreements that we can have with one another. And Paul knows that in order to have peace, there needs to be peace within the church. So he tells them, hey, listen, you ladies, straighten up. Did you ever grow up in a church where the pastor would call the kids out while the preaching was going on? Did you ever remember that kind of? How many of you was that, were that kid? Were that, okay, all right. All right that's right. I won't call you out in the service. He says, I then I ask you also, you true companion, help these women who have labored side by side. Now, this phrase, true companion, is a very interesting phrase. We don't find it anywhere else. 
We don't know if this is a phrase that kind of Paul kind of came up with, or maybe this was actually possibly a proper name of somebody else in the church. We're not really exactly sure what this is, but apparently Paul's saying, hey, ladies, the two of you can't get together, so go find this particular person. They knew who it was in the church, but they didn't get called out for whatever reason. But if you have a problem that the two of you can't work out, then go get this person and help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. See, sometimes you and I are going to disagree. And the person sitting beside you, you're going to disagree. And sometimes I'm going to disagree with you, and it's your fault. It just is. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sometimes you're going to disagree with me, and it's my fault. It just is. I'm sorry. Sometimes we're going to disagree, and it's nobody's fault. We're just disagreeing, right? And these are believers who can disagree, but there's a process in your disagreement. The first thing that you're supposed to do is you go to that person and say, hey, we're disagreeing here. What's going on? This is one of the, this is one of the weak links in the church oftentimes. We get frustrated with somebody. We have something against them. We disagree, and then we don't talk to them because we don't like them. And guess what happens when we don't talk to somebody? We begin to think the worst about that person. Because surely they're not the best about that person. We always have a tendency to think about the worst about that person. And Paul's saying that may be happening here. So you need to go to each other and solve this. And then if you can't solve that, the two of you, then get somebody else, a true companion, somebody that's trustworthy, somebody that's valuable, somebody that knows some things, and bring that person in and say, hey, we got a problem here. Happens in church all the time. Happens within the kingdom. Our adversary loves to divide us because so-and-so said this and -and so-and-so said that, and now they're on different sides, and all of a sudden we've started 14 more churches because we disagreed about something that doesn't really matter. Happens in business. Happens in family. Happens in all these kinds of things. There's a process for this. Matthew tells us how to do this. (coughs) If you've forgotten, then you go to the leaders in the church because you want the unity of the body because the unity of the body is so critical in the advancement of peace personally, but he doesn't stop there in this whole process. He goes on to another level. He says, basically, pressing on without joy leads to misery. And here's what happens to us so many times. You and I keep doing the right thing, forgetting why we're doing the right thing. Nobody else is doing the right thing, and we get mad at everybody else for not doing the right thing, and all of a sudden, we're mad because we're doing the right thing, and nobody else is. That's why Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. We even put it to a little tune to help you remember to be joyful, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. I mean, we've got lots of songs, right? Tenors can sing too. It's okay to have a high voice. Those are important. You've got to have that too. <coughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Why? Because if we're not careful, all of the difficulties that we face, all the things that aren't working the right way can take our joy away from us. And not just the stuff on the outside, Not just the battles that we face on the outside with other people, but even sometimes the battle with ourselves. I don't know if you've ever failed yourself or not. I don't know if you've ever said, I'm not going to do that again, and you go back and you do that again. Well, the reason you don't always able to do what you say you're going to do is because you're a sinner needing of grace from a Savior who provides that for you, who doesn't get angry when you sin, but invites you to come back home when when you do. So there's joy that's supposed to be part of this. We've already talked about that. Ultimately, it's the pursuit of joy is ultimately what we're going for. To rejoice in the Lord, again, I say rejoice. And then he goes on, verse 5, <clears throat> let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord is at hand. This reasonable word is a great word. It's a word that we, don't really, we really can't translate from the Greek with just one word. Some of your translations will say gentleness. Some of your translations will say kindness. Uh, just, uh, we struggle with that word, translator struggle, because it's really kind of a, I prefer to think of it as a sweet reasonableness. It's that ability to understand and to be kind and to receive and to empathize and sympathize and yet still do what's right. You know some people who do what's right, but they do it in a way that is not right? Paul's saying here, as you do things that are right, do them in a spirit of rightness. Do it in the spirit of kindness and compassion. Understand that person that you're engaged with is broken just like you are, faces difficulty just like you are. Now, this is all set up for where I'm trying to get to. I wish I had time. (coughs) Again, this is an overview of Philippians. Because if we just looked at Philippians the way that we should be looking at it, we would probably never get out of the book of Philippians. Because there's so much depth here for you and I on how we live, how we interact with our spouses, how we interact in our businesses, how we're supposed to interact as a civic duty. All these things are tied in the passage. But I kind of want to get to a piece that I think is the core of this, 
which is how do you get peace in the world that's so difficult? And then it comes to verse 6 is where we're going to spend most of our time. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything... Let me go back. You've already missed it. Some of you have already gone off. Pay attention. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Did you see the distinction there already? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. To be anxious or not to be? I don't know how many of you are anxious this morning. Don't know. But let me try to help you, if you are not anxious, to be anxious. Can I help you with that? Can I help you with that? The world is in trouble, right? There's the Russians coming to get us. There's the Chinese coming to get us. There's Islam coming to get us. The media... It's pointing every direction of where everything's going to go up. You know, the, markets, the stock market's been going well for so long, it can't keep going. can't keep going like that. All the stores are shutting down. You're not going to be able to buy anything. My son ordered something off Amazon just recently, and I'm like, why did you do that? That is a Sears and Roebuck catalog. That's all that is. He's been waiting for the Wells Fargo wagon to show up in the last week. And I'm like, we, in the 80s, we had this idea that we had stores, and we would go and want something, we'd go to the store, we'd buy it, we'd bring it home. We wouldn't order it in the catalog. That was such a bad idea. And so now everything's catalog order. There's not going to be any stores, right? We've got climate, con- climate uh, out of control, right? I mean, it's warm here in February, right? By the way, everything's going to cause cancer for you. You know, you know that. Everything's chocolate causes cancer. You know, it's all this stuff. Radio waves cause cancer. We're all going to get sick and die. You're going to outlive your retirement. How am I doing? Anybody feeling anxious right now? Your kids, they're in trouble. There's trouble right here in River City, right? Everywhere you look, there's problems. There's bad things. Your cholesterol's too high. It's too low. Your blood pressure's too high, too low. Some of you are on meds to raise it and meds to lower it. And you're like, what in the world is going on here? We're in trouble. And now, oh, your grandkids, they've got to live in this world. Oh, wow. Man. Anybody not anxious at this point? We we don't have to worry about the anxiousness. It just shows up. Everything is trying to cause us to be anxious. The news is trying to make you anxious. The headlines are trying to make you anxious. And we have a choice. We have a choice as believers. We have a choice whether we're going to join in that party of anxiety. I'm not going to give you all the Greek words about what anxiety is. You know what it is. It's that fear of anything and everything. It's the looking out and going, oh, no, it might happen. It could happen. And you have a choice to make as a believer. And your choice is to go along in the flow that you're being pushed, in the way that you're being encouraged, to be panicked and worried about everything. You have that option. It is an option. It is not a good option, but it is an option. And it is an option that I take far too often. I I was even worried about this weekend, because that's another word for worry, by the way, anxiousness, anxiety. Anxiety is the fancy word for worry. It's what it is. And I've been anxious about this week because I ask us to make some adjustments in our schedule, and it's going to be different than what it is every week, and we're going to have a lot of students here, and you know how students are, they're loud, right? And they're going to drop some stuff on the carpet, and I've been picking up the carpet here this morning, going, oh no, I don't anybody see that. And I've been worried because it's going to be not 9.30 and 11, it's at 10 o'clock, and oh my goodness, these people, I know how they are, and they're just not smart enough to know the time and the clock, and they're not able to show up at the right time because they've been coming that week. And so, Lord, you know all these people, this is just not going to work. Lord, what are we going to do about this? And then the offering, oh, we've got to take up an offering. It's so easy for all of us to be anxious about the silliest things. And here's what's so strange about anxiety. Once it starts, it's very difficult to stop. Have you ever started feeling anxious and then you're being anxious about feeling anxious? Which makes you what? Anxious. And it just feeds that anxiety. We get more and more and we get out of control sometimes that our anxiety, 
The world's coming to an end. Yes, it is. Get over it. (laughs) I'm going to die. Yes, you are. Maybe not today, maybe today, but you're going to die. It's going to happen. Why are you anxious about this? It's a choice. And I'm not saying the emotion, the emotion just kind of comes in the world. Pick up the news. I don't even watch the news anymore. In fact, in fact, it is so good now because one of the apps that I have that feeds me news, and I, I'm a news junkie. I like to know what's going on. It's not good for me. But now they've got it that I can screen what comes to me in the news. So I, I've listed some things that, that I don't want to know about anymore when it sends all this news to me. If it, if it says Trump, I don't want it. And so I just click block, not because I don't care, but I don't know what that's going to be saying about our president. And I just don't want to hear it. Bad news in the weather. Don't want to hear that. In fact, I'm kind of down to cute puppies and kittens. Yes, send me that. (laughs) Send me lots of stories about kittens. Oh, look at that kitten. Look how cute that kitten is. Hey, look at that puppy. Isn't that a cute puppy? That's what most of my news is today because otherwise the news is there to cause anxiety to me. And I don't need any help being anxious. I am really good at that. And so are you. So Paul says, we can either worry or we can have a little talk with Jesus, right? But in everything, instead of being anxious, notice he says, do not be anxious. Do I need to go back to that slide? I bet I do. Be to be anxious or not to be. Let your request be known and we go back to the slide. Do not be anxious. Pretty clear. Christian, why are you anxious? When the body dies, we get to go and be with Jesus where everything is perfect. Why should we be anxious when the doctor comes in and says you're going to die? We should thank him. Thank you very much, doctor, for telling me I'm going to die. What do you mean I'm not going to have enough money in this world? Great, my treasure's not here. My treasure's there. Awesome. I'm doing a good job, aren't I? I have nothing left here. I'm leaving this place with nothing. Awesome. It's a choice. Do not be this. It is so easy to be this. Everybody wants you to be this. But we have a choice not to do that. Let me get back to the slides where they are. Do not be anxious. Do not worry. Have a lot of others. But in everything, by prayer and supplication. You know what supplication is? That's another word for prayer. Prayer is kind of the general word. Supplication is kind of a specific word. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That sounds like prayer. So instead of being anxious, we pray, pray, pray. We go to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is bizarre. This is crazy. Lord, I don't know if you know or not, but the Chinese are coming to get us. They're buying everything. I don't know if you know this or not, Lord. And we got that guy doing this and that girl doing that. Lord, this is bad. Lord, do you know these things? And the Lord's like, yes, I do. And I placed you there so that you could be a person of peace to people who need peace because I'm the ultimate peace. And it looks like you're going to pieces. So stop it right? Come talk to me about those things. Let your request be So when you come to me and you're feeling anxious, here's the questions I'm going to ask you, because these are the questions I ask me. I'm going to ask you, have you prayed about it? Oh, I'm anxious about so-and-so. I don't know what's going to happen. <coughs> have you prayed about it? Are you praying about it? Will you pray about it? That's my prescription. So no one needs to come to me ever again. Here's what I'm going to say to you, right? <clears throat> have you prayed about this? And by praying, do you think I mean just kind of like, Lord, would you do that and then quit? No. Jesus tells this crazy story about this woman who comes and pesters this guy. And, and in the story, he kind of portrays God as the guy being pestered and you and I as the pesterer, right? Which is pretty good because we're pretty good at that. And he says, that guy is going to get up and meet the need of that woman even though he doesn't like her, even though he doesn't care for her, just so that she will stop talking, that's what he said. That's the parable that Jesus tells. And then he says, but our Father's not like that. Our Father loves us and cares for us. And if he loves us and cares for us, he's going to give us the things that we need. And even if the crotchety old guy does that, we know that God will do that for us. The problem is that we're not spending enough time with him. We're spending too much time in this world focused on the things of the world rather than on the things of God and rather than on God himself. 
We'll talk more about that because I'm going to ask you then, what is your perspective? What are you concentrating on? Paul goes on to say in this passage beyond what we're going to get to today, here, what are you focusing on? What is your attention on? Because those are the things that are going to determine how you're thinking and living and operating. So, so the question is, are you feeling anxious? The question is, have you prayed? And in like serious prayer, are you praying and will you pray? But there's something else beyond that. Did you notice the phrase that was there? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. This thanksgiving is the concept of acknowledging what God has done in the past. Isn't it funny how we are with God? Hey, God, I got this big thing that's coming up, and I know you've done everything, and you've, you've always been there for me, and you took care of all that kind of stuff, but God, I just don't know if today you're going to be there. How offensive that is to, that would be to me. It would, be like, it would be like calling and saying, hey, the bus has been here every day this school year, but I don't know about Monday. I'm, so I'm worried about where the bus is going to show up and pick me up. I know it's been here every single day in the past year, but I'm worried about the bus, and so I'm going to call the bus driver. Are you going to be there? How are you feeling? How the, how's the cedar pollen going for you, Mr. Bus Driver? Are you going to be there to pick me up? I'm worried about this. I just don't know if I can trust you or not. And maybe your bus driver is not that trustworthy. I don't know about that, but I can assure you that the God who got you this far will get you the rest of the way. And for some of you, he's gotten you a long way, has he not? He brought some of y'all. This past week, I was talking, the week before, I was talking to one of our young men that we're going to be licensing. And he told his story. And I'm not going to interrupt the sermon to tell the story. But I walked out of that room believing in the gospel again. I'm like, God did that to you? And he brought you through that and you're here and you love him? Oh, this is a bigger God that I've ever experienced. He's bigger than you've experienced too, by the way. So do you have thanksgiving? So have you prayed with thanksgiving? Are you praying with thanksgiving? Will you pray with thanksgiving? Because if you don't, you're not going to get the peace to press on. You're not going to get the peace to stand firm. And then I've I've created a new word. I'll talk more about this next week. But I'm going to ask you, have you scriptured? I know scriptures in that, as a noun. I'm going to turn it into a verb or adverb or some other thing beside a noun because we'll talk next week about have you prayed? That's great. Have you scriptured? Are you scripturing with thanksgiving? And will you scripture with thanksgiving? In other words, will you go to the scriptures? Will you allow it to impact you? Will you meditate on it? Will you breathe it? Will you memorize it even? Will you know it? Will you learn it? So, so all of that said, <coughs> if you're not doing that, then I'm going to ask you to do that because I think that's the prescription for anxiety. I'll probably also ask you to turn off the TV, probably ask you to reorient your feed so that it goes to more cute puppies and cute animals and other things. But if you've not done this, then you need to do this, and not just for a day, but you need to do this for at least six weeks. That's what it says, take six weeks to build any new habit within us, new eating habit, new working out habit. So you need to do these things for six weeks. And this may mean that every hour you have to say, I'm going to spend the first five minutes every hour talking to the Lord because I'm so out of control in my anxiety. That may be your prescription. It may be that you spend the first 10 minutes of every hour. It may be that you spend five minutes every 30 minutes. It may be that your Fitbit, instead of popping up telling you to get up and walk around, that it pops up and says, pray, or Jesus, or something. I don't know what you need with your anxiety, but you need to go to the Lord in prayer oh, enough to overcome the anxious feelings that you have. And for some of you, that may be more than others. Some of you are not anxious people at all. In fact, some of you are sitting around going, what is that guy talking about today? I have no idea. There are just some people that you can hit them with a Mack truck and they go, hey, wow, that was great. But most of us in this room are not like this. Most of us have worries, I hope. Am I the only... Anybody with worries? Okay, for the, rest, for the two of you this morning, I'll continue the message. The rest of y'all feel sorry and pray for us, those of us who have anxiety. All right? If not, do that. But then if you've done that for six weeks and you can come back and show me when you've done all those things and it hasn't worked, then come back and talk to me because there are chemical imbalances in our bodies. There are damages that can be done and there's legitimacy to those things. And we'll talk about it. And we'll work through that. We'll get you medical help. But until you can show me, here's my six-week prayer journal, where here's the times that I've prayed, here's the scriptures that I've looked at, I'm going to just look at you and go, don't be anxious. And here's the pattern, here's the way that you're not supposed to be anxious. Here's the way to avoid anxiety. And here's what's amazing. This week, I was anxious early in the week, so I did this. Later in the week, I was anxious, I didn't do it. 
Guess when I felt the most anxiety? Was it the first part of the week or the last half of the week? Yeah, the last half of the week. Because I wasn't doing what I knew to do. And here's what happens then. Verse 7. Here's the good news. I don't have to get out here until 10 o'clock today. And so I can just <laughs> preach. And so my tech guys, no, we've got to we turn the room off. So it's already 9.04. I have 15 seconds. So here's it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. One commentator says it's like a double guard gets put out there. It's a double guard. But these things only happen, the peace of God only comes when you've done all these other things. See, our, our problem is this. Our problem is that we always get this confused. <laughs> there's a horse, there's a cart. It's very easy. It's very easy. There's a rider and there's a horse. It's very easy. This, by the way, is a car commercial for rear horsepower is what it was, for rear horsepower. I don't, I don't know what it was. It, is so e- it is, should be so easy to know where the horse and the cart go in this, but here's a problem. We want the benefits of God without God. We want the peace of God without God. We want the peace that passes all understanding without having to do those things. We want the Father's stuff without the Father. Just to remind you of this, Luke 15. The younger of them said to his father, you're old and you're going to die. Can I have my stuff now? That's what it says. Some of you have children, and as you get older, this conversation is going through their mind often. Okay, dad's going to die soon, so what am I going to get from that? Father, give me the share of the property that's mine. That's what Jesus tells the story. There's two brothers. One younger brother wanted his stuff. Comes to his dad, says, Dad, you're going to die. Can I have my stuff? And the dad, gracious, gracious dad, oh my. My sons wish they had a dad like this. Said he divided his property between them. He went ahead and did that. Oh, my sons wish they had that. But notice what happens to the guy. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had. Younger son goes to dad. Dad can have my stuff. Sure, here's your stuff. And the son takes all the stuff, and he takes a journey into a far country. Why did the son go to the far country? Why didn't the son just set up right next door to dad? Because he wanted the father's stuff and not the father. And that's what you and I want. We want the peace of God without going through the process of God. And you know what happens when you do that. We want the father's stuff without the father. But here's the thing. The blessing is the father, not his stuff. The peace of God is a byproduct of getting to know God. And so where is your horse and where is your cart? Do you want the peace of God? Then you must pray. The peace of God comes when you choose not to be anxious and when you pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Oh, I have a tendency to be anxious. Oh, my I've got kids of a certain age, and they've got decisions. They're going to change their life. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life. News media is telling me we're all going to die. We're going to run out of money. We're going to run out of everything. And I'm anxious. But I don't have to be that way. Some, some of y'all may be thinking about, I'm going to die. How am I going to die? How's that going to go? What's going to happen? And you may become anxious about that. I don't know what you're anxious about this morning, but you don't have to be. It's a choice you're making. Now, now it's an easy choice to make because so much is pushing you that way, but it's still a choice. And you don't have to be anxious because you can go talk to God about it, and God will listen to you because of what Christ has done for you. (coughs) Even in your spirit, when you sin and you have a hard time recovering from your own sin, God will still hear you and still love you because of what Christ has done. So, where are you today? It may be that you don't have peace because you don't know the Prince of Peace. Coming to know the Prince of Peace comes only one way, through repentance and mercy of God. Repentance from you, mercy from God, as you ask Him to forgive you of your sin. That's the only way to find peace. And Christ came to bring that to you if you'll repent of your sin and if you'll trust Him. And you can do that today. Maybe that you have legitimate reasons to be anxious. I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned. I'm not anxious, that you, meaning that you shouldn't make decisions and make a plan. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that when that gets out of control, it's out of control. And there's no reason for that to be out of control for the believer who knows the one who controls all. And so maybe this morning, as you press on, as you persevere, a tough marriage, it's getting tougher instead of getting easier. A, a tough financial situation, a tough physical situation, As you press on, you talk to Jesus about it, and he'll be there for you. For those of you who are having to stand firm, 
because of the attacks that are coming both outside and inside, you can do that as you talk to Jesus with thanksgiving. And you don't have to be afraid. Oh, Father, we're thankful that you came to love us and to tell us we don't have to live this way anymore, that we're free in Christ. Father, may we begin the steps. May we make the decision today not to be anxious, but rather to trust in you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song, a response, song, reflection. Maybe you need to make a decision. Maybe you need to make a, a prayer commitment. Maybe you need to join this church. Whatever it is, would you come?